Okay, so welcome to the first night of our three-day cooking at Beluga Palooza event. My name is Jen Christofferson, and I'm the Alaska Outreach Coordinator for Defenders of Wildlife. Uh, with me, I have Suzanne Steiner from Beluga Well Alliance and Katie Bear Nalvin, our Alaska Marine Representative from Defenders. So we are very excited for all of you to join us this evening. So let's real quick, uh, see where everybody is from. So if you want to use that chat feature, it's down at the bottom of the screen. You just hit the chat button and you can drop in where you are participating from. From We kind of want to see if we have most mostly Alaskans or we reach outside. Oh, hello from Long Beach. Nice and warm there, I'm sure. Anchorage, okay, Western Washington, Los Angeles, Eagle River. California, Alaska, Jay Bear, Newport, Anchorage, Oregon. <laughs> Suzanne's here in Alaska, that's good. <laughs> uh, Fullerton, California. Awesome, so all over kind of, all West Coast. I guess it's kind of late for East Coasters right now. <laughs> Perfect, well that's fun. All right, so just as a reminder, once again, in case you missed it, this event will be recorded. During the event, participants will be on mute. If you need to make a comment, you can use the raise your hand function or put a note in the chat box. Um, I'm going to be monitoring it throughout the night for questions and comments during the event. Uh, we have two more nights this week. Tomorrow night will be our story map and short animated film premiere. Thursday night, we'll have a special visitor, Tyonic, who was born in Cook Inlet, if some of you are familiar with him and we'll see what our volunteers are viewing out in the field. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with our organizations, we will give a short introduction to who we are. So Defenders of Wildlife is a national nonprofit organization. We have a local office here in Anchorage, which is on the traditional lands of the Daina Ina. We are dedicated to the protection of all native animals and plants in their natural communities. In Alaska, we are working to protect the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, Kenai National Wildlife Refuge, Eisenbeck National Wildlife Refuge, Tongass National Forest, the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska, and other key ecosystems from the threats posed by climate change, unsustainable development, and unsound wildlife and habitat, habitat policies and management practices. We focus on endangered species, including polar bears and coconut beluga whales. Now I'll turn the time over to Suzanne Steiner, president and founder of Beluga Well Alliance. Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us to celebrate and kick off the first night of virtual Cook and Lit Beluga Palooza. And uh, I'm Suzanne, as Jen mentioned, uh, Suzanne Steiner, Beluga Way Alliance's founder and president. And I'm based here in Girdwood, Alaska. And uh, our organization is a 501c3 nonprofit and NGO that sprouted up here uh, in 2017 along the shores of the Turning and Arm here in Cook and Lit. Um, and it really grew out of my graduate work in conservation biology. Uh, being a community member here along the sh shores of the Turnigan Arm and realizing that so many people here in this region value uh, seeing our endangered cook and lip beluga whales but might not know a lot about them or about the, their conservation status like for instance that they're endangered or how they can become key participants in helping keep these belugas from going extinct. Um, so we work with Defenders of Wildlife on the uh, Cook and Lit Beluga Recovery Implementation Task Force <laughs> that was started a couple of years ago to prioritize outreach actions uh, to help spread awareness about our Cook and Lit Belugas. So what we're doing right now uh, is part of that uh, here with Beluga Palooza. We also helped to establish the Alaska Beluga Monitoring Partnership and we facilitate currently shore-based citizen science um, and beluga monitoring along the shores of Cook Inlet at a variety of key sites and have helped train uh, over a hundred volunteers to help us collect scientific beluga sightings data. And we also help uh, put on with Defenders as well and other collaborating organizations uh, the annual Belugas Count event um, since 2017, which unfortunately the fourth annual event was canceled this year due to the global pandemic, but we're really excited to be hosting, co-hosting this virtual Cook and Lit Beluga Palooza in the spirit of Belugas Count with a number of our collaborators this year. So thanks so much. I'm really looking forward to painting a beluga whale <laughs> for the first time with you guys tonight, um, learning about belugas and sharing more about our organization in the days to come this week. 
Thanks, John. Thanks, Suzanne. All right, now we'll get started with our paint night. I'll introduce our artist, we'll paint and have a short intermission where we'll learn a little bit about belugas. This is the drying time, and it's gonna kind of be at the beginning because we have to do the background first and then we do the bell. Um, and then we'll finish up the painting. So our artist tonight is Carrie Becker. She is based out of Eagle River, Alaska, but her style was developed with influences in realism, post-impressionism, and Hellenistic. She was trained in the fine arts from Brigham Young University in Idaho and graduated with a degree in integrated studio that focuses on in-depth studio work with an emphasis on crossing conceptual and media boundaries. Finding the textures, movement, and shapes in nature is Carrie's true passion and inspiration. So now I will turn the time over to Carrie. Hey folks, sorry we're at a weird angle, but we're gonna be painting this way, so I wanna keep this uh, beluga in view for you guys. All right, so we're gonna start off with just a quick look at our palette. Um, I, we're gonna be using non-fancy paints. I've got some big bottles from just the local craft store, nothing too fancy. We're gonna be using our black, our white, our blue, and our green today. So this is more of a sap green. This is kind of an um, ultramarine blue. Um, but whatever blue you have or whatever green you have, um, ocean comes in many different colors all across the world. So, and like black and white, I mean, how more basic can you get? So, all right, so we're gonna start off with our big brush. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna be painting the background, letting it dry, and then we're gonna be doing another layer, letting that dry while we're giving it a little intermission. So we're gonna take our big, Wherever big paintbrush you have, we're gonna dip it a little bit in the water and just see how it's not super sopping wet. I can just kind of barely get it across the back of my hand and it gets it wet. We're gonna take, we're gonna take some of our blue like this and a little bit of our green. We're just gonna mix it in there. But mostly I want blue as I start. So we're going to start with little X's, okay, as we go across the, cake, the canvas. And this is going to give um, texture to the back of the painting, because as you're filling in each of the little divots and holes in the canvas, it fills it in depending on which way you're stroking into the painting, okay? So we're just going to go around our painting. I'm just going to get the corners and the edges real quick. And just, we're going to be doing a bunch of X's. It already looks like waves. Yeah. That's what's giving us our texture in the background. More paint in there. All right, so as I get down to the bottom, I'm gonna add a little bit more green. Because as we get darker, we get a little bit darker green into our blue. All right, here we go. You guys can see that pretty good. All right. Nice relaxing brush strokes. This is my favorite part because, you know, it's not super constrainous or anything like that. You can mess up and it's perfectly okay. Get into that little crack where the canvas is being held. Otherwise, you end up with a white spot. That's not fun. All right. I'm just going to blend a little bit more green and make it a little bit more dark towards the bottom of mine. All 
Running it up through, making it nice and consistent. A little bit. All right. Now, now we have a bunch of X's. We're going to lightly drag across. We're going to just do this to kind of knock off any of the big ledges that we left with our brush. See how you can still see some of that texture underneath, though? That's what we want. How's everyone doing on time? Leave it in the chat. How are we doing? I'll tell you if anybody, anybody if we're going too time? quick or too too slow. I'm probably not too slow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I probably could use a little bit of time. I had to mix up some uh, some paints to get the right like blue color. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll let All right. Guys, we'll let this sit for a little bit as I, as everyone catches up and such. Yeah, it looks like we're going a little fast. So okay. no worries. This is no worries. This yeah. is not a rushed thing. We can definitely take it. I'm also mixing my blue so that it it looks a little more like the waters, even more of like the waters of Cook Inlet. Yes. <laughs> oh, so like gray, a silty. Bit, yeah. <laughs> Barely can see through. I'm just kidding. <laughs> also, also just by necessity of <laughs> the colors that I have tonight. <laughs> yeah, we gotta work with what we have, right? <laughs> so. Oh, oh, yeah. Brush size can affect how long it takes to paint the background. So no, yes. no worries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a big two inch brush for that reason, because I, I'm very impatient and I like to get things done. <laughs> like, Whoa. Is there yeah. any other way to paint? If you don't have a big brush, just take your hand. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking, like, can you imagine trying to paint the entire background with a brush this big? That would be quite the I could task. see myself starting out like that. <laughs> you think, oh, it's not going to be that bad. And then you just, oh, yeah. This is how you get arthritis. <laughs> arthritis, is that what you call it? Yeah, arthritis. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Let's see, that was. So we'll yeah. give you a couple more minutes. It's only been two minutes. <laughs> And I don't know if you can notice, but the bigger bucket of water that you can get to wash your brushes in, the way better it's going to be. And never drink your water, okay, guys? It's not advisable. You have to label it, because otherwise you might just try to take a swig. A lot of my art professors and stuff would just grab random coffee mugs and fill them with water and such, and be just rinsing off their brushes real quick in a, in a water coffee mug and uh, accidentally would just be like, oh, it looks like coffee now. And then, oh, no, nope, not coffee. <laughs> so, Carrie, for those of us catching up, do you mind just going over um, that ladder part um, again? Yeah, sure. Just like the horizontal brush stroke. Yeah, so when we're going over the horizontally, we're just, we're lightly angling the brush. Let's see if I can. Instead of painting like this, we're going to be painting like this. And you see how it just knocks off. It's very light, whereas if I was going at it like this, it pushes into the painting. We don't need to do that. We're just trying to knock off those ridges. So we're going to go across the page. And you want to start off the canvas, going off the canvas. Reason being, is if you start on the canvas, you're gonna get this weird ridgy thing going on on the edge. And ain't nobody like big weird ridges on them, so. <laughs> and don't worry if it's not dark enough, this is the under underpainting of the background. We're also gonna be putting another layer on top of this. And that's where we get to have fun.
How's everybody doing? Have we kind of caught up? I know I'm Speedy Gonzalez. What is that saying? Speedy Gonzalez. Speedy Gonzalez. Is that like a person? It's the little um, cartoon mouse, isn't it? Is it? Oh, yeah. Okay. Like Looney Tunes? <laughs> <laughs> been a few years. <laughs> All right, I don't see any messages saying that they still need more time, so uh -huh. I think you're good to move on to All the next. All right, so this layer we're gonna be painting a little bit thicker, so you're gonna grab a little bit more paint on your brush, go crazy. Okay, don't go crazy, crazy, okay? I don't want to hear that someone ended up painting a whole house blue, so. All right, so I'm gonna start with strokes across. And I need to tighten down my canvas because it is going everywhere. Hold on, sorry. Technical difficulties. <laughs> All right, so we're going to start with strokes. Okay, so try that again. So we're going across, starting off the canvas, pushing through and off the other side. So I got to be careful. My white's dripping down. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have a, oh, your yeah. own beluga on the palette. Yeah. I'm just going up and down, just trying to pull that some of that paint. I want a little <laughs> heavy on. I'm just trying to pull it down the canvas is what I'm doing right now. I'm getting just a tiny little bit of water. All right, Carrie. Am I going too fast? You're, you're going a little fast. Am I? <laughs> People are like, oh my god! They're like, slow down. <laughs> yep. yeah, we'll, we'll just slow down a little bit. <laughs> okay. All right. Sorry. <laughs> She's just so excited to paint some balloons tonight. Oh man. <laughs> I painted one the other night and it was really fun. So this is this is great. <laughs> she got sneak peek. Yeah. Wow. That was the guinea pig. <laughs> So if you're tracking on time with me, we're just trying to keep the paint wet because it's important for our next step. So just keep going over what you've already painted, okay? We're just trying to make sure it stays nice and wet. I try and die. I'm just kidding. That's not the bad. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Can I always add more paint? Oh, look at me. I ran out of blue paint. Look at me. Underestimating my my bloom abilities. Never get a klutz and a painter in the same way together. It just happens to be on both, so that's fun for everyone I live with. <laughs> Okay, so as I paint, we have a question here. As I paint, I keep removing paint showing the canvas. What's your advice? So that means probably the underpainting wasn't that dry. Um, that's going to be okay. Um, you can just uh, essentially, essentially, you're getting a little bit too much water on your brush and you're getting it re wet instead of adding more. Paint. So if I were to, let's do an example on mine. Dry brush, just water, I'm just gonna do that. This is my dry section over here. If I go like this and scrub at it with water, <gasps> oh no, that's okay. Don't worry about it too much. We're just gonna not add as much water to your brush. We're gonna take that rag. We're gonna just scrub at it a little bit. And that's just removing the excess water that we had on there. Um, and we're gonna just repaint over it. And we'll let that kind of dry a little bit better this time. And Masking is the key to painting. You just try to cover up what you 
lasted. Okay, so. So adding too much water is what's going to pull up the previous layer of paint. So I'm just going to keep going over the canvas. I'm not really doing anything. I'm just keeping everything wet and moving. Hey okay, guys. So nice and long strokes. So when you, some of you guys might be experiencing what I'm just dealing with right here. And what that is, is the wood, the canvas is wet, and so it sags a little bit. It's completely normal. And what it's doing is it's pushing into this uh, frame I have underneath. And so when I push against it, the brush doesn't realize that their canvas kind of sunken in. And so it'll leave a little gap. So if you just scrub in it and then go over it lightly, they'll correct that. Okay. I'm just keeping everything wet. Okay, it's been about five minutes, so. Okay. So okay. as we have a wet canvas still, it's still tacky. See how my finger get, got left there? That's perfectly fine. I don't need you guys to touch it, don't touch it. Uh, <laughs> What you're going to do is you're going to crumple up some newspaper. You want to make some interesting shapes, something like that. You're going to support your canvas from behind because I don't want you to shut it off the table. <laughs> and you're going to push it into the wet paint. It's going to leave a mark. And I'm going to resituate each time before I push down. That way I don't have a, ever have a repeating pattern. Be aware, this might get your hands messy, but never trust a painter that has has a uh, has clean hands, like because that means it's not doing that. Right. Okay, and eventually you're gonna have texture kind of like that. That's what kind of replicates the sunlight moving through the ocean. So, if your canvas is too dry to get that, just take a your nice trusty already blue wet paintbrush and you'll just go over that area real quick you don't need to get it super wet or dip it in the water because then you're going to remove paint so you just get it re-wet with some more paint on your brush and you can crush it in all right so just work your way down the canvas at your own pace and just be situating this in a new fashion each time before you place it in okay See, I'm a little dry there, so I'm just going to go like this with my slightly wet pan, uh, paintbrush. And ta-da! It worked again, so. Carrie, if they don't have newspaper, what, what, what else could they use? So I actually would even use, like, copy paper. You just, uh, you'll have to crumple it a lot and recrumple it to kind of get it away from that really stiff paper. If you have some sort of thin paper, like, um, you know, a legal pad or something like that, I actually originally used a legal pad paper to create this effect and this newspaper was cheaper, so. <laughs> Yeah, oh. newspaper's not as easy to come around across nowadays. Someone, with. someone used tissue paper. That's a good idea. Yes, yeah, you can use tissue paper. So you have to be careful though, because it will get too wet and stick in your painting. So make sure you're using a lot of new sides every time you do it. Okay. I have had a disaster to happen. Okay. Looks like Shelly is using a grocery bag. Ah, it's also good idea. Creative, creative.
grabbing a little bit of water on my breath because I might I've got some really dry spots. So I'm just gonna lightly work on. So breaking my own rule, you know. Very satisfying when you get a good one. I'm just going back to places that I feel like I want a more, a little bit more light coming through. And I always like to make it lighter towards the top. Reason being is I feel like the light would be lighter towards the top of the ocean. See, dirty hands. Oh. <laughs> And just as a heads up, um, we would like to see everybody's finished products at the end. So kind of keep that in mind. We'd love um, at the very end, we'll see if we can turn on some cameras if you want to show your, your Beluga painting. And if you don't want to show everybody, you can always email me privately. And if you want me to share it, we can share it on social media or whatever. Okay, so. When we get to this point and you've got the whole canvas textured, then we're going to let it dry completely before we add any white to it. That way we don't have the blue fading into the into our white. We want a nice clean edge. So we'll give we'll give a couple minutes for this for folks to finish up blotting uh, their paint with their newspaper. And then we will have our Alaska Marine representative, Katie Bear, um, give us a short little, probably about a 10 minute spiel. Um, and this really is going to take up some time while we're waiting for our paint to dry and you'll learn some cool, neat facts about belugas. So, um, and also if you want to like fan your painting while she's talking, you know, your sound is off, so you should be good. Air blue dryer works really nice. All right, well, hi everyone. Um, I'm sharing my screen for a little brief presentation. I don't know about you all, but my hands are blue. So I'm hoping that I don't get blue all over my computer. But um, welcome and thank you so much for joining us for this evening of art advocacy. This is our very first ever Beluga Palooza and our very first ever paint night. So we're really excited and I'm glad to see so many people uh, attending. This is awesome. Um, my name is Katie Bear Nalvin. I'm the Alaska Marine Representative for Defenders of Wildlife, and I'd love to take some time to talk a little bit more about our belugas and the work that we do. So for those of you uh, who don't, maybe don't know so much about belugas or who may be joining us from other states, um, belugas are found globally throughout the Arctic Ocean with five stocks, or you can kind of think of them as populations in Alaska. And Alaska is a really big place, so this map can kind of help orient us to the specific population we are talking about, the Cook Inlet Belugas. So Cook Inlet there is uh, circled in, in the red down in um, south central Alaska. And Cook Inlet Belugas, they're 
geographically and genetically isolated from all other belugas. Um, so the Cook Inlet belugas do not travel outside of the Cook Inlet and they do not mix with any other beluga populations, meaning that there's no replacement for Cook Inlet belugas if they're gone. The historical population estimate for Cook Inlet belugas is a little bit over a thousand, so most folks say around 1,300. Locals used to say that there were so many belugas out there that it looked like white caps in the inlet when the belugas would swim by. But sadly, the population has declined over 75% from that of the historical estimate, and the current population estimate is just 279 individuals. So since we're about to paint a beluga for our next step, I thought that uh, we should talk a little bit about their biology. Um, so belugas, they're very social animals and are famous for making all sorts of noises. They have even earned the nickname canaries of the sea. And where belugas, places where belugas live, like Cook Inlet, the waters are often icy, have low visibility, are often silty and dark. So belugas have some adaptations that make it possible for them to live in these conditions. For example, belugas rely heavily on their advanced echolocation abilities to find prey and hunt and communicate and avoid predators. Also, unlike many other whales and dolphins, the vertebrae in a beluga's neck are not fused together. So that means that they have much more greater flexibility in their necks and can move their heads around. And while we're on the topic of their heads, they actually have this kind of bulbous head you can see in some of the photos there. Um, and that's known as a melon. And it's, it's made up of this like fatty tissue, which helps them to echolocate. And they can even move this melon around to help direct and receive sound waves. And another adaptation that these belugas have is they lack a dorsal fin, which makes it easier for them to swim under ice, especially when avoiding predators like orcas, for example, which have large dorsal fins. They also have a very thick blubber layer, which helps to keep them warm in these cold waters. Adult belugas are white, and you can see that in the photo up there, and they weigh about 3,000 pounds, about 14 feet in length. So they're about the size of the average SUV and the weight of about like a VW bug or like a slug bug. Anybody plays that game? I know we do. And uh, baby belugas, they're born gray, like the one in the photo, and they develop that white coloration as they mature. Beluga mothers are pregnant for about 15 months and devote a lot of time and resources to, to raise their one little baby. So Cook Inlet belugas are exposed to a variety of stressors and threats, such as habitat degradation, oil and gas exploration, noise pollution, strandings, and climate change. It is often difficult to understand the magnitude or intensity to which each of these threats and others can harm belugas. And it's likely a culmination of all of these factors that's limiting the Cook Inlet belugas from recovery. Likewise, Anchorage is the largest population center in Alaska. Over 65% of Alaska's population resides along Cook Inlet. For these reasons, it's really important, um, it's really important that we can be as precautionary as possible and work to mitigate any harm to this vulnerable population. Because the belugas play a key role in both the Cook Inlet ecosystem and the cultures. So what we do here at Defenders, our Beluga program is pretty expansive. We work through partnerships, we do education and outreach, monitoring and advocacy. But what I hope you'll notice as I continue on with the presentation here is that we can't do any of this without you. Most of our Beluga work is accomplished through our ever deepening partnerships. Some examples of these include our work with the Alaska Beluga Whale Monitoring Partnership that we'll talk about in a little bit. Some of you might even participate in that. Um, we also have a partnership with the Native Village of Tionic, other NGOs such as Suzanne with Beluga Whale Alliance, we love working with her, and other conservation groups as well as federal and state agencies. 
we also work to promote education and outreach efforts about the belugas. In the past, we've partnered with Beluga Whale Alliance to host a Cook Inlet Beluga education program where we brought about 75 third graders out to see belugas and participate in a monitoring session. We hope to continue this program sometime in the future. We have also made several educational materials, including workbooks and fact sheets and worksheets. Um, Jen will be happy to put out a link to our worksheet where kiddos or adults uh, can learn about the population by graphing the aerial survey data. And you can also reach out to Jen for any of these materials if you would like to do the worksheet and share your graph with us. Um, we might even have some rewards, but you'll have to contact Jen for that. I'll, I'll post her email here at the end. We also do monitoring. So we host and co-host sites for the Alaska Beluga Monitoring Partnership and Belugas Count. Both of these programs rely on volunteers to help us gather data. The data helps us to better understand how belugas use Cook Inlet during what, types, uh, during what times of year. And you can contact any of us to find out how to get involved, although I will say that we do have some restrictions in place right now due to COVID-19. We also work with lawyers, policy experts, scientists, and other partners to engage in science-based advocacy. We push for the Cook Inlet Beluga population to be designated under the Endangered Species Act as endangered in 2008 and we also worked to designate critical habitat for them. Today, we closely watch what is happening in Cook Inlet. We review all the actions that are proposed in the inlet and submit comment letters to the proper agencies. And there's a lot that you can do for us and the Belugas. Uh, we actually have a couple of action alerts that are live right now that pertain directly to our Cook Inlet Belugas. Jen will put links in the chat and we will also send out links later on. The first action is to tell the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation to stop, to stop permitting industry to dump waste in Cook Inlet. The second action we just launched live today and the comment period ends on October 13th. This action is target at BOEM, so the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, and we're asking them to choose their quote, no action alternative of not holding a lease sale in Cook Inlet. So we encourage you to read the language that we wrote in the actions, add your own words, and make your voice heard in these really important issues. And if you live in Alaska or when you visit us, uh, we also invite you to text Belugas to 33222 to get live text alerts from Beluga Whale Alliance where the Belugas are active. Another partner, Alaska Wildlife Alliance, also hosts a texting service for the Kenai River area specifically and you can find it, see their website or contact us if you would like information for that. But please always share your sightings and photos at cookinletbelugas.com. Uh, belugas can actually be identified, so individuals can be identified from photos. So any photo you have of them, no matter how good or how poor you think it is, please send them in to cookinletbelugas.com because these photos can really help researchers understand this population. And to kind of follow us up here, um, you can find us on Facebook. We would love for you to connect with us. Uh, you can connect with us by just searching Facebook for Defenders of Wildlife Alaska and also Beluga Whale Alliance. And stay tuned next week because we are having another amazing webinar. Um, it's a whale-wide webinar with several of our Defenders field offices. So we'll be featuring our Cook Inlet Belugas, Southern Resident Killer Whales, and North Atlantic Right Whales. And we also hope that you join us throughout the rest of the week. Tomorrow we have the premiere of our story map and animated video and we'll hear from the Georgia Aquarium and Betty the Beluga. And on Thursday night, we will hear from experts, learn more about AKBMP, the Alaska Beluga Monitoring Partnership, and check up on Tyonic, the little baby beluga who was rescued from Cook Inlet in 2017. So that's right, we're zooming in a, a real beluga. <laughs> and you do have to register for those events. So just say something in the chat box if you need the registration links for those events and we can definitely get them to you. And with that, thank you everyone. Like I said, feel free to contact us at any time, myself, Jen, or Suzanne. 
And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. And once we finish up questions, I think it'll be time to resume our painting. Thanks, Katie. I did put the links for tomorrow and Thursday night sign up in the chat box along with all the links to the take actions and our Beluga worksheet. All of this can also be found on our website. Um, but if you want to copy and paste right now, that's also an easy way to do it. And I'm going to wait for a minute and just see if anybody has any questions for Katie. Or if you have, I guess if you have an art question too for Carrie, you can always drop, drop it in. Hopefully your paintings are starting to feel dry. So um, you can touch the back of the painting if you have a, a canvas um, kind of like mine where you can, see, you can see my finger moving through it. If it's cold to the back, it's probably not dry yet because what you're feeling is the difference between the water and the paint and uh, the air, it's cooler. And I felt mine and I was like, okay, it might be cool enough. And so I touched it with the back of my hand. This is dangerous, so approach with caution and it comes back and it also gets more of a matte finish if you see any shiny spots avoid those don't test for wetness there <laughs> it, okay it says oh it looks sorry <laughs> Fingered my you. email. <laughs> oh, yes, I do know my own email. It's supposed to say defenders. Thanks, Susie. <laughs> I, will, I will get that edited. Yeah, thank you, Susie. <laughs> Susie, would you, would you like to edit all my work? <laughs> You're hired. Uh, okay, Jay Christopherson. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Thanks for that catch. And if everybody has this information copied down, Katie is probably going to stop the screen share and we're going to transition back over to our canvas. Yeah, thank, thanks for listening, everybody. If you have any questions at any time, please feel free to reach out. We're always happy to chat. Um, if you can leave a little message in the chat box if you're... Um, canvas or whatever you're painting on is not dry. That'd be great just to kind of see how many people still need a little more drying time. Okay, someone's canvas isn't dry yet. Couple, oh, three, four. <laughs> okay, we'll still, we'll still wait a little bit. If you want to expedite that, you can also grab a blow dryer and plug it in and fan it off, or fan it off. Don't get too close with the blow dryer to your paint. Um, if you have a hot blow dryer, it will burn the paint if you're super aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> you really want it to dry. <laughs> it more shows up on like white paints, but Okay, a few people's, a few people's is dry. Okay. okay, cool. So this is the fun part of paint night where you literally are watching paint dry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For those that are dry, they can practice. Essentially what you're going to be practicing while we're watching paint dry <laughs> for everyone else. So this is just, I took this drawing and I broke it down. I took my painting and I broke it down for you guys into that PDF. So inside that PDF, um, that's the first cover page. Um, but this is the first step we're going to be taking on our painting. It's a little small printed out, but um, you can kind of just, if you have it printed out, you can kind of feel what it looks like on your painting. Um, or I like to gesture um, and get a little bit of muscle memory in there. And you just you kind of go over it. And then you also go over your painting with a dry brush. Don't get a wet brush. Yeah, and you're just gonna kind of mine where you're going to paint. This is our practice session. Um, 
if you have chalk, you can use chalk and draw your line. Um, but we got a nice curve right through here. So if you look at it kind of like this, you can see it's part of a bigger oval. But we're just going to be making just a small section of it. I'd be too creepy as you're stroking your canvas. I'm just showing folks that we will be recording this so they can also re-watch this. Perfect. Some people are using hair dryers. I feel like only an artist would have like a designated art. I have a lot of designated <laughs> weird stuff. So, like measuring cups. You wouldn't think you'd need measuring cups as an artist. You do. I use them all the time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> neat little trick that you can do with chalk that not a lot of people know about is the standard just the standard like dollar 99 cents box of chalk right you can actually sharpen it if you have one of these bigger folds pretty great you can draw on canvases and it erases out pretty neat if you want to cheat sheet it but i didn't warn you guys about that so it's a bonus tip. Where do we find the recorded session once it ends? Um, so usually what we can do with these Zooms, we can turn them into like a YouTube video. So we can post it on our Facebook page. You can email me for it and I can send you also the copy of it. Um, I guess it just depends on how we <laughs> want to put it as a video, but there will definitely be opportunity to view this video again. All right, so let, let me check. Oh, yeah. Oh, someone's like, it's almost midnight. <laughs> must be on the East Coast. What time is it? It's like 8 o'clock. Wait. What time is it? It's almost 8. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's late. <laughs> there might be an option that we can send it to everybody who signed up for paint night as well. I'll look into it and see what the best way to get this video out is. Okay, let's see. Oh, I guess it's only been five. It's been about five minutes since everybody says theirs is drying. Who's got a good gesture on their dry paintbrush, dry paint thing? Everybody got a good half. Well, I guess it's one fourth of an old one, essentially. <laughs> don't wanna, you don't want to get it too close to this edge. So even as you're practicing, it's important to keep in mind that we're we'll be extending the blue out this way. So. Yeah, we'll work on emailing it out to everybody. Looks like lots of folks want, want it emailed. All right, so we have more folks saying that their canvas is dry. It's been... Do not dry. <laughs> Let's drop my paintbrush for everyone. That didn't know. <laughs> <clears throat> 
Oh. <laughs> Couldn't hear, had the blow dryer on. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> it's okay, we were just, you know, talking about watching paint dry. <laughs> and we're going to email out um, everybody the video once the Zoom world gets it. I don't know what they do, packaged up and <laughs> sent to me. <laughs> yeah, we're going to package up every individual slide. Is it called a slide frame? Frame. frame. <laughs> turn it into, we'll turn it into probably a little YouTube. <laughs> All right, so it looks like quite a few people. So we can probably move on to the next step, Carrie, if you're ready. So for those that were drying their paintbrushes and couldn't hear me, um, you're going to want to get a couple good gestures in with uh, a dry paintbrush and a dry canvas. Essentially, what we're going to be replicating as we're doing this gesture is this curve. It's about one fourth, maybe a little bit more of an oval. And we're just, it kind of flattens out at the bottom. We're just trying to make sure that we don't go too far this way and we don't want, we want about, yeah, maybe about two inches from the edge of your canvas if you're using the same proportions I am. Um, we're going to just, you're going to do a couple dry runs of that. Okay, so we're going to take a dry paintbrush and we're going to just barely dip it into our white. Okay, so and I'm going to make it so it's like we're going to flip our paintbrush over so it kind of pushes it into the bristles. And we're gonna, this is going to create like a kind of dry texture paint. Okay, and this is going to be our sketching paint. What size of brush are you using? So this one is my medium brush. Um, this is a six bright um but you can use even this type of paintbrush if you wanted i do not recommend our big boy but um our medium sized paintbrush or your small one if you would like to sketch with that um i like sketching with this one because that's what i've been doing for years so so we're going to do that little sketch of that brush and go on this real light. I don't know if you guys can even see that on the camera. Mm -hmm. We're just doing a real light gesture of that. Okay. Kind of making like almost like a chalk line. Okay. And you can kind of see how it's a bigger oval size if you want that's the kind of shape you want to go for is like if you were to take an oval that was this big and just paint only this section of it I'll let you guys take a second to get that down kind of this bottom part's going to be more flat because that's where the blue is pulling out of its dive and we want to be coming back up Oh, as for the blue paint brushes, I would keep those in water um, if you didn't wash it in the time that um, we had, but keep it in dunked in water so it doesn't get dry and crusty on you because nothing's worse than trying to unruin a brush. Resuscitate a yes. paintbrush. <laughs> what you can do though, if it does dry off, is you just take a razor blade and just like slice off some of it. I've done that a couple times. Good to know. That's not the best way to do it, but <laughs> if it's really, really broken. Artist tips. Yeah. I know it can be nerve wracking to put down a little bit of white on there, but don't worry, we're going to be covering up the majority of this with our thicker pieces. So, like, this is just center, centrally going through our piece right here. Okay. Not too close to the camera. Actually. No, that was good. Okay. So everyone kind of made their little lines. 
It sounds good. So the next part is going to be the next part, page of the PDF. We're going to be making three circles, okay? This is going to be our head. This is our body. And this is actually um, representing in the painting the big muscle that controls their tail. They kind of have this, it's not, it doesn't come to a perfect, it kind of comes out a little bit funky, and that's actually on the mantle. So we're trying to replicate that by adding some extra bulk right through here. Okay? So you can pick up a dry brush if you would like to practice the ovals a little bit. Um, essentially, at the end of my line right here is when I want the start of this bowl to begin. And this one's nearly touching that one. So I'm going to make a little line in my drawing. Oh, can't brush dry that a little bit too much. Yeah. So I'm going to just mark this is where I want one of my circles to end. This is where I want another one to end. So I'll pick up right about there. And I want it to go to about there. And then the last one's gonna be right about, actually that's a little hot. I'm gonna go a little bit lower on mine. Okay, so. Okay, so I've marked where I kind of want my ovals to end. That way, when I'm drawing it with my paintbrush, I kind of don't go over the mark, okay? So the, they have a nice big round head. So we want to make our ovals kind of more bulbous at the front and not, we don't want it to be too thin, okay? We don't want footballs, we want ovals. So we're going to go like that. Nice big round head. You can even stretch it out probably a little bit more. Okay. The next one, we're gonna do somewhat. We're already we're dry. All right. And go again. Now with this big one, it's the main mass of the animal. So we need to come just a hair below where we have this here. If these were on the same line, this would actually be shorter than this. So we're going to go a little bit down below, moving up. Okay. Let you guys catch up if you need it. I'm gonna make mine a little darker for the camera. That's all I'm doing right now. Or I guess lighter because I'm doing my light. All right, I'm gonna move on to my tail one. I'm just gonna make this one nice and round circle. And the way I'm kind of moving it in a circle, I'm just kind of keeping my hand in one place and moving it around, keeping my hand at the, as the center of the, of the circle. So I'm keeping my hand like this pointed in as I move the paintbrush around my hand. It's okay if you get paint in like that, we're gonna be painting this whole thing white, okay? Perfectly okay.
drop a little message in the chat if you need some more time drawing your circles. Need more time? Yep. yep. The circles is like the most difficult part in my opinion because you <laughs> got to decide where you want your beast to be. No worry. Looks like Sam is nailing this. Awesome. Nice. <laughs> Beating out a Katie bear there. <laughs> I'm just rinsing my breath because mine's getting really dry. So you want to keep your brush nice and wet, okay? So who's ruining their mom's kitchen towels? It's not me. Don't worry, mom. I'm not ruining them. It's fine. <laughs> hey, is that ours? I'm just no, it's not. <laughs> no. I actually like to get these shop rags that they have just in the painting section. They're called carry cloths. Yeah. Um, also, cheap. shop cloths are super cheap. You can ruin the heck out of them. It's fine. This is water-based uh, paint, so typically you don't have an issue, but... When I'm dealing with my oil paints, oh my goodness, it gets everywhere. <clears throat> yeah, we probably couldn't do an oil base painting oh, for paint noise. No, no, no. <laughs> it takes too long to dry. Yeah. That's a multi day process. <laughs> you actually, they do have like things that like make it dry faster, but they're not as pretty. I don't know. Give folks a few more minutes here. When I first did this drawing with Carrie, I was like really nervous to just paint on the canvas, yeah, like the white about, on top. <laughs> you're worried about your underpainting. Yeah, I liked my underpainting so much. But <laughs> it was silly because even if you go outside of the lines, you just get that underpaint color and like oh, yeah. go right over it. And so you're like, oh, okay. Still have the blue, no worry. <laughs> You can always go back and fix it. Acrylic is very forgiving that way. It dries fast enough that you can go over a mistake really, really easily, which is nice. You just have to be patient enough to let it dry before you try to correct it, because then you'll just muddy the water. And you'll have a blue beluga. <laughs> yep. Well, I mean, you know, they're in the water, so they get a blue cast, okay, Jen? They're not actually full water. <laughs> and if they're juvenile, then they're gray. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm just wiping up because I left a little ridge right there of paint and I don't want it to come through, so I'm just smoothing it down. I use my hands a lot. It's called finger painting if you use it for more than 90% of your painting. Yeah, I think that's what someone in the chat said, oh, finger yeah. painting. Um, well, you know, I'm an expert. Kind of like, don't trust, don't trust a skinny cook, don't trust a painter that doesn't have paint on the hands. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm gonna take my paintbrush out of the water. Just tap it off. I'm just gonna wipe it inside this rag, get it nice and dry again, okay? And all right, and we're dipping back in the white. I'm just getting that same amount of sketching amount that we had previous, so I'm not heavy or anything. All right, so the next part of this painting, it's gonna be connect the circles, okay? So we're doing a straight line from the top of this beluga. Um, head to this beluga body. So we're just going to go whoop, like that. Nice and simple. Then we're going to make um, another line from right about here, same place on the other circle, and we're going to connect it down into this one. And you're going to try to just blend it in. You don't want sharp lines like that. Um, I did that on purpose so you guys can see. You don't want to do that. You want to kind of blend it like this one. So it kind of Eases into it, okay? Two straight lines, just connecting the two circles. It's so weird not to be able to see what they're painting. It's so strange. 
Like, <laughs> I want to see where everyone's at. Be like, oh, yeah, that line's too high, that line's too low. All right, so everybody got their lines connected? I don't see anybody in the chat saying okay. no. <laughs> All right. So um, we have the top of our top of our um, spine right here, essentially, right? We're going to take our paintbrush at the top of that. And we're going to come around the back of this circle, okay? And then we're going to connect it down here. So we're just flowing around. Try to hug closer to the spine if you can, because you can always push things out. You can't pull things back as easily. That makes sense. Um, Any question? One said no. That didn't make sense. Okay, so. I have the top of this line that I created here. I'm going to wrap it around the back of this circle over here. And we're going to pull it this way. If I painted too far out this way and made it too fat right here, I'd have to do a lot of blue to kind of cover that up. Whereas if you hug closer to this spine or this line right here, you can always, I can always push out this way if I need to. I can always draw or paint further out. That answer your question? Maybe. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> All right, so we're going to do the same thing, but kind of on the front side of this, okay? So we're going to take the top, we're going to touch down right here, and we're going to curve close to the spine and to the top of our big circle, or our big oval. I'm just making mine wider so that you guys can see it a little bit easier, hopefully. Looks good on my screen. All right, so now that we've got all those lines connected, we're going to be fleshing out essentially the head of the beast. So we're going to be only looking at this part. I don't want you to get intimidated by the back half. But I added just a little dimple right here to represent the mouth, essentially. So I'm going to round that. Out, make that a little bit lighter for you guys to see. And what I did for it, I just took my paintbrush like this and drew like that. Just one line moving backwards into, into my circle. Can you do that up close for them on the yeah. white paper, maybe? Something. 
So I did that like, so I'm, let's see. Oh, sorry. Oh, paintbrush is too long. Sit right there. There's my circle again. Okay. I took my paintbrush, set it right there, and moved it, moved it a little bit more wet. Okay. Moved it here and moved it back. Creating just a little dimple of the circle going out. Back, push down and back. You don't want to make it too big. That's it's supposed to be very subtle. So don't worry if it's too small. Size doesn't really matter. So I did right there and I just kind of evened it out because I had a little bit of too many brush um, markings in there. So just smooth it out a little bit without making it too much bigger. All of our belugas have mouths? Or what are they called? Mm -hmm. Because they have, they're called uh, dolphins. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm like, I'm in my own mammals, so snow. I can say I'm not asking you all about that. Let's move a little faster. Okay. Okay. All right. So, well, a little faster, not a lot. Okay. <laughs> so, we're going to work at our tail now. We've got the spine that was coming up here, right? The spine was coming up through here. So, now we're just going to emphasize that and drag it down. Make it a little bit thicker. And what that's going to be is the spine of the edge of the fin. Hopefully everyone has that emphasized. We're going to then take our paintbrush and we're going to make about, um, about eh, maybe half an inch down from the edge, bottom and back of that. We're going to make a little bit of out. And essentially what I'm doing with that is I'm just, say this is where I think, I'm just going like this with my paintbrush ever so slightly. I'm just going like that. And for you guys again, just going like that. Maybe a little, a little bit more emphasized. Very subtle. And then from that point that we came out, we're going to come down about the same amount that we did from the top of the tail to the middle of the tail to right about here. So right about there, I'm going to make another, I need a little bit more paint, another one coming out like that. And what we're doing is we're creating that little half moon. And then we're just going to make a little triangle on the outside of it. And I can do that close up. So we did this part of the tail. We did this part. And we did this part. And then we did a triangle going like that. And then we paint it all in. Whoops. We got 
the center of the tail right there. That's what that is. And then this is one part of the fluke of the tail. And we got the other part right through here. If you're painting on a smaller canvas, it might be hard to distinguish, but we're going to outline it at the end with black and that should bring out some of the detail. Okay, so we're going to paint all of this white at this point. Okay, so we're just going to go through at your own pace and just paint everything white. So one of the things you can do, instead of pushing paint over something, you can push paint up to something. So by putting my um, paintbrush flat against here and pushing up, I'm pushing paint into an area instead of like dragging it across. And sometimes that's how it's better to get small details into your painting or get rid of mistakes is because then you're doing a little bit more fine detail. And it already looks like a beluga. I'm already there, by the way. I just messed up. I went a little too far out accidentally because I was rushing. So I'm just going to bring it out a little bit further and just re emphasize my nose. So, okay, whatever yeah, looks screws up once in a while. Is everybody staying pretty on track? Yeah, how's everyone doing? How we do we have we have a white beluga? All white belugas <laughs> or gray belugas if you're doing <laughs> a baby. Let's see if anybody's yep, yeah, good. Very good. Okay. So I just rinsed off my brush real quick, just because I'm a neat freak and that it was pushing up on the edge of my thing. So you don't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we're good to move on. All right. Any other comments? So we're going to move down to doing our fins now, okay? Essentially, there's one that's going to lie outside 
the where we've already laid down the light, and so that's what we're going to focus on. So I'm going to get some light on my brush again. So I don't know if you can tell where you previously had your circles just from memory, but uh, mine is going to lie right about here, and my edge of my previous circle was here, if, if you can see. And so I'm just going to move it back just a little bit because he's rolling. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull the paintbrush sideways like that. You don't want it straight down or anything. You want it kind of at an angle. And there's just one brush stroke for me. It might be a couple for you to get that thickness. Okay. So that's one fin down. Um, right now, you really aren't going to be able to see it um, very well, maybe on the camera. But if you take your white and you do the other fin, moving um, a little bit closer up to where your circle began, um, you're going to be able to see it in your own painting because you'll be able to see where you laid down the white. And my fin is just going to be a line going out like this and then pushing up slightly here. I'm going to demonstrate it on the black so that you can see it, okay? Because I don't think you can see it on, yeah. on camera at all. So, um, okay. mm -hmm. so I'm going to go like this, and then I'm going to come up a little bit at the end, okay? And this essentially is the tube where it attaches. And then this is kind of where the water is pushing up on the fin. Okay. Let you guys kind of look at that a little bit. All right. Got two fins down. Now. What we're going to do is work on the dorsal ridge. So the dorsal ridge is just right here on our painting. It was on the back half of where our slope of that um, circle used to be. So right about here on mine, as you can see, it's just right where this starts to slope down. That's where we're going to put our dorsal ridge. So I'm going to put mine right about there on my camera. Kind of weird paint kind of side this is sort of directly in front of me. <laughs> Can't film that. Give me a All right. So I'm just re inciting that in a little bit lighter white. That's all I'm doing. All right. So we should have that dorsal ridge laid in there. Um, now what we're going to do is grab our black. Actually, I'm sorry. We're going to do gray first. I'm sorry. So you can rinse off the brush a little bit, get a lot of that white off. He doesn't have to be perfectly clean now because we're going to mix white and black together. So I'm going to take about this much white at first, maybe not that much black. Mix that together. Yeah, that's about right. I might want it a little bit darker. Okay. So, as you can see, that's about 20% black maybe. So I'm going to take that dark, dark um, light gray essentially and we're going to be going underneath where you painted that white fin. So you're going to stay underneath that and you're going to kind of outline your white fin in your gray. And you are painting wet on wet, so it might be a little difficult, okay? Don't worry, that's normal. 
And it's okay if you go a little bit of gray where you don't want to, because we're going to re-emphasize it in white. Okay. And I'm going underneath the belly, coming out this way. And just creating these shadows. Okay. It's going on the bottom. More gray. So this is my lighter gray. I'm going to take a little bit of extra black and make this one a little bit darker than what I had just done. Okay. So show you that on the palette. So not a whole lot difference. I don't know if you can tell. Just a little bit darker, okay? We're gonna go over that little thin in the back because it's farther back, it gets a little bit more black. I'm also going to take that little bit darker of a gray, and I'm also going to just make some lines here where the muscles are. So that we've got one that lies kind of mid of the animal, um, and then we have one that kind of goes back from here going forward. Here, you want to show them the finished painting up close, the sure. shading, just, yeah. it's a little harder to see on the oh. painting. Yeah, it's probably too far away. Okay. Yeah, it's harder to see when it's wet. When it's, yeah. <laughs> Over the hell did I go like that? I don't know. No. Mm -hmm. okay, just okay. I, was like, I was thinking maybe like overexposed or something. Can this reach further? Hmm? Can this reach further without messing me up? And it'll drop if it goes further, unfortunately. Okay. How are we doing on our shadows, guys? Oh, we got thumbs up. All right. Okay. So we're also going to take that dark gray and we're going to make this back part of the fin recede a little bit by adding some gray right there. Okay. You can set this off to the side if it's going to get, if it's really thin. Um, paint it'll dry so you can dip it in the water if you'd like. Um, we're going to be switching to our small brush and we're going to be switching to the black. Okay guys? Don't worry, it's not that intimidating. It'll be okay. So if you want thin lines, you're going to thin down your black just a little bit. And I just barely touched in so you can kind of see. Just a little bit, kind of make it look like mascara almost. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite so thick. So what we're going to be doing is outlining our white. So you want to ride more on the white than you do on the background, okay? Because we're kind of trying to frame it in. Um, unless you have a really skinny beluga, then you would ride on the blue side. So if, say if I, let's do for example, right back here, if I wanted to thin them out, I would ride solely 
on the, oh man, it's hard to do sideways, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Solely on the white, if I wanted to thicken them out, I'd write on the black, okay? Or I'm sorry, not write on the black, write on the blue, on the background. So, key areas that we want to focus on when I want to, I'll let you guys just outline here in a second, but things I want you to focus on is see right here, we fade slightly into the white purposely to create that dorsal ridge and bring it out. We also bring up this tailbone and we make it more, um, more at focus by adding in that contrast right there. But you don't connect it, right? You do, I don't connect it. You could connect it. I, I think it looks better not connected. Okay, and then we're gonna tackle this fin separately. So I want you guys to work on is from this point to this dorsal ridge to outlining this fin moving up to here. Okay, we'll let you guys do that kind of in silence for a little bit and let me know if you have any questions. <laughs> My head in the way. Nope. It's like really fun to just watch you paint. <laughs> it's like therapeutic. All right, so hopefully everybody has got their beluga outlined. So when we're working on the head, you know how we uh, trailed this piece into here? We're gonna do the same thing with the head piece. So show you close up on this point here. So I went like across like this, kind of flat over this way, and then trailed into the piece right there. That kind of 
shows that mobility that belugas have over other men, other whales, right? I don't. Um, Is there problems? Someone just said, I don't. What, what did you? Oh, so. So I, when I came across, I outlined this way, moving in, and then you see how this, is it close enough? Mm -hmm. So this trails in, we did this, and we did it over here. And what that emphasizes is that this piece, the dorsal ridge, is pronounced above just the rest of the ridge line. So that little tail in, and this little tail in, add a little bit of depth that shows that it gives a little bit more range of motion. It doesn't make it as stiff. Which is how belugas are. They can yeah, they can move their heads. So, did that clear up your question? I'm gonna say yes, I didn't get a reply, so. I'll probably focus on trying to keep my head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I have so much time. <laughs> yep, it did. Perfect. I know it's also hard to type and paint. I know, yeah. <laughs> they got rough jobs. I just gotta have them. <laughs> <laughs> It's still not dry. So. Once again, I'm painting with my fingers, guys, so I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Everyone able to do the head part okay? Can everyone get through that? Seems to be. Okay, so the next part, we're going to be doing this little nose here. A little cute little nose. So we're going to be trailing into our white again right here. And we're not focusing on the mouth quite yet. We're just going to wrap the paint around here, okay? So we're just going to wrap it like that, okay? I'm going to pull it in slightly. So it makes that little bit of a ridge showing that it's um, not a flat surface. And it looks best, in my opinion, if it's tilted up ever so slightly. Kind of like you're wrapping around a finger. See how my finger fits into that spot real nicely? It's round. Not flat. Oh my gosh, that's good. See my finger fits right in there. Nice and round. Okay, so we're going to work our way down the chin. So we got the round piece right here. We're going to come down at a little bit of an angle. So right about here, and then we're going to start curving it in towards, um, I'd say, if we look at it, let's see, this. see how much that angles in like that. We're going to pull the paint brush in. So I'm going down and then I go in. Pull that. I wonder if I let's try something. 
Yeah, why don't you try pulling it closer? See if this is so it's fine in detail. We're just going in like that. Making that kind of that pivoting point on our beluga. Any questions about that? Perfect. Now we just have a few people that have to leave, so okay. they'll send a picture. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> yeah. All right. And then let me have Jen take the camera again. We're gonna go. We're gonna make a little fat ridge because lugas have triple chins. So aren't you lucky that you don't have that? <laughs> we're gonna make another one right there. I just. I'm cutting into the white that I already have. I'm not building out white, just keeping it to the green. Look at this cameraman. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Above and beyond. Okay, and we're going to do it one more time. Taking chunk towards. And then I'm going to connect my previous line to the chin lines. Any questions about that section? Nope. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we're going to outline the fin that we just did. Come down. All right, I grab a little bit more black. Sorry, guys. I'm abusing my cameraman. <laughs> okay. All right, so hopefully everyone has that outline, and we're gonna come in to our previously outlined in gray uh, fin. We're gonna come through like this. Thinking around our area. So, I'll give you guys a moment while you do that. This was like the hardest part for me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I really struggled with the thing. I don't know why. Okay, we're awfully thick over here. Oh, that's good. Can always cover it with gray. Yes, exactly. So we have an iris beluga. So we're going to make some rotating folds around our beluga's arm, okay? This, we're going to do a line across. Okay, just like that. More paint is needed to make the thin line. We're glad you're having fun. <laughs> that was the idea behind this knife. I'm gonna go around again like that. Kind of making quotation marks. I'm gonna make another set of quotation marks around the other side. Kind of like that. Thank you. 
All right. All right, now for the, the fun part, the map, guys. We're gonna use our finger again to kind of gesture and help us figure out where it's round, okay? See how I can tell, look at that. It's round right there. So use your finger to kind of like, be like, okay, this is, this is okay. It doesn't, it's not gonna go straight across. I'm gonna go, I need more paint. <laughs> Kind of mimicking this curve that we have up there. I kind of have a little bit of a goofy smile at the end. Kind of like that. The coworkers are always happy. Yeah. In some pictures, um, it looks like the smile goes down. I specifically was like, no, I want a beluga that's smiling. It's just happy to be there. Okay. I know that's probably one of the trickier spots, so it's kind of fun to give our beluga find some characteristics. So. I'm just kind of eating out my brush strokes. You know? okay. And so from the eye, from the edge of the mouth, we're gonna to go to the eye. Here we go. So my finger scale. I'm gonna go out even to where I ended the circle. About if this is half right here, I'm going a little bit above half. I'm just gonna make a dot. Happy little dot. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna come across this way so that I can get the round part of my brush. Okay, and little eyes. And we're gonna take, we're gonna make another set of quotation marks. Nice thin little, little lines. Any questions? So far, I know that was a lot in one jump. questions okay no people are oh, right. people people are feeling like professionals look at you guys <laughs> oh my gosh i'm excited to see everybody's belugas so i'm going to go back in with my gray and i'm going to show you how to correct the spot that i messed up on i know i'm just kidding <laughs> so i'm my paintbrush went a little thick here so what you're going to do is you're going to take your color of what you're painting on and you're just going to push up into the piece and you go thin out the line just like that like a magic eraser yep exactly i'm just going to even that out make sure to hide my mistake So looks, looks way thinner right through there. Nice, nice. I'm also going to put a little bit while I have my gray. I'm just going to put a little bit of shadow between the mouth and the nose. Whoop. See, a little too dark. Okay. Use my finger. Yeah. I'm going to put a little bit in the back just to kind of make it look more like a cavity because it goes into his face. And yes, I just decided to use my
Okay. I don't know if you can notice on mine, but I have some blue showing through. If you have that, you can finish that up. And you just re-go over it, trying to finish up what you essentially kind of missed. And yeah, and then you're done with your beluga. So you just reshape up, essentially, cleaning up anything. Um, put, like You do that push method I showed. And you can shape up the lines, shimmy up the lines. Re-emphasizing the whites of the whites. You always want to make your brightest brights the tops of, or where the sun's coming through. So I like to put a big chunk of white on the top. All right, so we'll let everybody continue to paint and ask me any paint questions. Paint perfect. If anybody has any questions for Carrie or Belugas in general, <laughs> now's the time. And let me. Where yeah, so. Where do Belugas go for entertainment? <laughs> the orchestra. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> Um, perfect. Yeah, so we'd love for you to send us photos of your paintings. Um, you can email them to me. We, we're hoping to have a few more of these wildlife paint nights, so look for those in the future. And once again, you'll find them on our Defenders of Wildlife Alaska Facebook page. And we're hoping that you'll join us tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Alaska Standard Time for the segment two of our Cookie Lint Beluga Palooza event. And let's see if we can. I think people can start turning on their cameras. Oh, can you re emphasize where to shade, Carrie? Yeah. So, what we're trying to do is emphasize the underside of this fin. Um, or, I guess, yeah, is it thin? One of yeah, okay. So we're trying to bring out the darkness, though how light this is by emphasizing underneath. And then um, this is gonna be where the light's hitting it. You wanna kind of add dark or slightly darker, kind of from about a little bit less, a little bit more than halfway down the white. And, maybe down. and you want to make the darkest point right before you hit your black outline. So you can add more dark. I just dropped my email in the chat. You don't want a white line right before you hit your black outline. That's going to be off-putting to the eye, and you're going to notice. So you can add a little bit of darkness to even down over here if you'd like. That's like next level stuff, though. So, But you may have to go over your black again if you do go over it with the gray. Switching between black and white, or gray and white, back and forth. I want to
Perfect. So yeah, if you want to show us your belugas from home, go ahead and turn on your video. There's a strip at the bottom that says, I think it's start video. And that will start your video and then we can see how everybody's paintings are. I'll show you mine that I did the practice one. Ooh, here we go. So that was my beluga. What's really fun is, even though we're all painting the same thing, they all are a little bit different. Oh yeah, the different personalities. Just like our belugas in the wild. Even mine from one time to another turned out completely different. So. Yeah, that's like a smaller guy. Now, when you're painting sideways, it really changes the way you angle the brushes. <laughs> so we have like, what is this? We have three different belugas. Different Three different belugas right here. Lots of nice green. We're creating a pod. <laughs> yeah. Oh look, there's Suzanne. Awesome. <laughs> I love it. I'm gonna. Oh, hold on. I'm gonna. Where'd you go? Sam is turning up. Oh, wow. We've got oh, like a dang, wave of we belugas. Go. Some really good. I'm trying ones. to enter full screen here. Here we go. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Oh, hey, yeah. look. One of those taking the sunglasses. sunglasses. Nice. All right, Sam. Way to make it your own. <laughs> nice. These are great. Oh, oh man, we got some real talented people. Look at that. Okay, I'm trying to cancel the spotlight video so everybody see, and we'll do a gallery view. Oh, look at that. <laughs> oh man, look at this. Like fractally oh, like, like three in one image one. this is awesome oh look at that oh my gosh i like how that one is just like just power swimming oh my gosh these are great really. good job you guys <laughs> wow uh, we got someone doing a background <laughs> nice <laughs> good try zoo <laughs> oh <laughs> Oh, wow. Look at you guys. Go. Yeah, this is awesome. Yeah, thanks for Super joining us. impressed. Ooh, Nicole. Awesome. Look at these belugas. These are so great. Wow. Oh, I like how Katie, some of you guys no. turned it over to landscape mode. I'm <laughs> digging it, digging it. Oh, my gosh. It looks so good, guys. <laughs> this is so great. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Get some really talented painters. There we go. Yeah. Surpass the teacher. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So good, guys. Good job. Thank you. This is great. Thank, Thank you. you. Fun. Thanks, Thanks for joining. Thanks for joining us, guys. I'm gonna see the painter. I, I, can... <laughs> I know. I'm like I've been, been in the camera the whole time. This is what my face looks like. 